Hi, welcome to the David Rumsey Map Center. I'm Abby Smith Rumsey, and I'll be moderating this first panel. Um, it's, if I can take a little time to say how glorious it is to be back in the space, which is about the virtual and the real maps. There's a lot of technology you'll see, in particular the screen that we're using for this um, presentation. So I just wanted to say how glorious it is to be back in the map center and to have a total technology refresh, which I think you're all enjoying. Um, so I have the great pleasure of introducing and moderating the, the panel, panel three on the shared landscapes of early modern Eurasia. The first paper will be by Ali um, Yajulu um, about claiming space, sharing place, the economy of sovereignty in the Ottoman Empire. What's notable, I think, about Ali's work and the paper is, in particular, points to this, is the contrasting of Western and Eastern views of what sovereignty is. He's on the faculty here at Stanford, and um, I'm happy to say that he leads a very important digital mapping project, mapping the Ottoman Empire. Digital mapping is um, very important for worldwide study and can bring a lot of maps that people are distant from back to the culture from which they came. The second talk will be by Valerie Kibbelson, uh, Sovereignty and Indeterminacy in Siberia in the 17th and early 18th centuries. Valerie is at the University of Michigan on the faculty, the history faculty there, and we have much in common, including our interest in 17th century Russia. It'll be very interesting. Um, I will say that when we talk about Russia of any period, it is hard not to sound, even as historians, very presentist um, because, and as we know, there is no such thing as the past in Russia. So there'll be very, very many themes you see in her paper that have to do with what's going on in the present day in, in Russia and Ukraine. So first, Ali. Thank you, Abby, for the introduction. And thank you for uh, Martin, Karen, Salim for organizing this um, beautiful event. And this is my second in-person talk uh, since for two years. So if I, <laughs> I'm pretty like, kind of nervous about that. <laughs> I somehow get used to Zoom and all my notes on the screen and everything. I'm gonna read. Um, and I changed my title, which is, um, please accept my apologies. The earlier title sounds more interesting, I know. This might also work, we'll see. Uh, the long wars known as the Grosse Turkin Guide between the Ottoman Empire and the Sacra Lega started with the second Ottoman siege of Vienna in 1683. The Ottoman failed to capture the Hapsburg capital. After the Ottoman defeat in Vienna, the war expanded on mutual on multiple fronts from the Ukrainian steppes to Hungary, from Bosnia to the Peloponnese. The Sacra Lega was the Christian alliance of the Hapsburg Empire, the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, the Republic of Venice, and the Tsardom of Russia. After the Ottoman failure in Vienna, Buda, the capital of medieval Hungary, was captured by the Sacra Lega from the Ottomans in 1686. On the Ionian Sea, the Republic of Venice invaded the Peloponnese. In the summer of 1687, the forces of the Ottoman Empire and the Sacra Lega met in Mohac, which ended 150 years of Ottoman rule in Hungary. The defeat triggered a massive unrest in the Ottoman army and turmoil in Istanbul ending 39 years of reign of Mehmed IV. On the Ukrainian front, the Russian campaign on Crimea did not bring Russia a victory, thanks to a strong Ottoman Crimean defense. Still, this would not prevent Russia from capturing the city of Azov, enabling Moscow to enter the Black Sea. This sounds familiar, I guess. The final stage of the war took place in the Northern Siberia in 16, 97, in the Battle of Zante, the forces of the Sacra Lega under the command of Prince Eugen of Savoy decisively defeated the Ottoman army. Uh, the treasury of, uh, to provision the Janissaries and the Imperial seal, the insignia of the Sultan's sovereignty were captured, was 
confiscated by the Habsburgs. The Grand Vizier Elmas Mehmed Pasha was killed by his own soldiers who held him responsible for the defeat. Ottoman Siberia and part of Transylvania, except the city of Temeshwar, Timisoara, today in Romania, the capital of the province fell in the hands of the Habsburgs. The Ottoman defense system in Bosnia collapsed. The city of Sarajevo was plundered and burned by the Habsburgs. The historiography, uh, in the historiography, these wars seen as a turning point in Ottoman history and also European history. With these wars and the subsequent peace settlement, the Karlovitz Treaty, before that, actually, this, let me just, uh, these are two depictions of the uh, second siege of Vienna. And, and this is the Ottoman depiction of the first siege of Vienna. Um, uh, and, you know, the first siege of Vienna, actually, uh, there are multiple um, paintings um, uh, by the Ottoman painters, but the second siege is more kind of popular in the Western Europe. Um, in this, yeah, with these wars and the subsequent peace settlement in, in the Karlovitz Treaty, 1699, the Ottoman expansionism in Europe and the Mediterranean, which had continued since the 14th century, came to an end for good. The Ottoman Empire lost Hungary, which was the gateway of the Ottoman Empire to Central Europe. The empire's military inferiority vis-a-vis -vis the Habsburgs was documented. The Crimean Khanate, the vassal state of the Ottoman Empire, lost its superiority position in the Ukrainian steppes. It was now clear that the Khanate had no military capacity to stop Russian expansionism towards the Black Sea. On the Mediter Mediterranean front, the Republic of Venice was taking the revenge of losing Crete 20 years ago by establishing control on the Adriatic and conquering southern Greece, including Athens. While the wars triggered unrest and turmoil in, in the Ottoman establishment for Ottoman elites, it was now indisputable that the old fiscal military institutions did not meet, quote, the necessities of the time, end quote. The 18th century would be a period of reform on every front in the Ottoman Empire. Furthermore, these wars generated substantial changes in Ottoman political thinking and imperial ideology. It would not be wrong to argue that after 1699, the Ottoman Empire started to transform from an empire of conquest and continuous expansion to an empire of defense, status quo, or even an empire of peace. Karlovitz Treaty, the rather treaties actually, because there were multiple treaties um, with the members of Sacra Lega, was signed on 26 January 1699 after the long negotiations in today's Simirski Karlovsky, a small town in Serbia. The negotiations took place between the Ottoman delegation and the delegations from the Habsburg Empire, Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, the Republic of Venice, and the Tsardom of Russia. The negotiations were ar arbitrated by the envoys of the British Empire and the Netherlands. The Karlovsky negotiations produced one of the most de detailed demarcations of the territorial borders of the post westphalian world. After the conclusion of the treaty, local commissioners, notables, cartographers, and military engineers demarcated these borders in the coming months. Among them was Luigi Fernando Marsili, an Italian scholar and the eminent natural scientist. <clears throat> According to Rifat Abu al Hajj, a preeminent Ottoman, eminent Ottoman historian who just passed away uh, very recently, the Carlos Treaty was a turning point in Ottoman boundary conception. With the treaty, the empire's notion of frontiers gave way to delimited, delimit, delimited and fixed borders. The Carlos moment represents the formal closure of the Ottoman European frontier, which was a zone of constant con conquests, conquests and continuous expansion before. However, as in his recent book, Gabor Agostan argued that the importance of, quote, the importance of Karlovitz lay not in the delimination of the borders, but in fact that the Ottoman accepted, albeit reluctantly, European conception of sovereignty and territorial integrity of their neighbors, end quote. With the treaty, the Ottomans in a way accepted the norms and concept conventions of the Westphalian state system.
This is one uh, contemporary map uh, prepared by the Habsburgs. Um, these are the disputable areas um, and new borders between the Ottoman Empire and uh, the, the Habsburgs. Utis Posidietis, one of the most important, uh, sorry, one of the most important of these diplomatic norms was Utis Posidietis, which was a diplomatic principle stipulating that each party should keep whatever territory it possesses at the conclusion of the hostilities. According to this principle, the parties should withdraw all claims over the lands and communities which were kept by the enemies at the conclusion of the war. Utis Posidetis, which was a Roman legal conception to solve private land disputes, was refashioned as an international legal norm in Europe to maintain peace and stability on borders after conflicts in the 17th century. Utis Posidetis, or Allah Halihi in, in Turkish, Ottoman Turkish, was not a total new for the Ottomans, new concept for the Ottomans. Since the mid 16th century, it, it, in different occasions, the Ottomans and European countries applied this principle. Although occasionally implemented by the Ottomans, in most cases, however, the Ottomans refused to withdraw their claims over transborder regions because of their conquest ideology. Until Karlov's treaty, the conquests were seen as an ongoing activity, as peace, peace treaties were temporary intervals or in a way only ceasefire agreements. The Karlovist Treaty refashioned the Ottoman notion of borderland from a zone of constant tension and continuous warfare to a zone of demarcation for peace, territorial control and stability. Sultaname by Rami Mehmet Pasha. <clears throat> this is the text that I will talk about today. How did the Ottoman negotiate border delimitations? What were the assumptions concerning territory and sovereignty during these demarcations? How did they negotiate the principles of Utis Posidetis? To answer these questions, I would like to discuss some sections of a memoir written by Rami Mehmed Efendi, or later became a Pasha, you know, the Grand Vizier, uh, who was the plenipotentiary of the Ottoman state during the Carlos. Uh, negotiations. Rami Mehmet wrote his memoirs entitled Peace Treaties, Surname, or History of a Peacemaking, Wakai Maslaha, after the signing of the treaty to defend the Karlovs Treaty and the achievements of the Ottoman delegation during the negotiations to the Ottoman public. The treaty was heavily criticized by certain parties in Istanbul, not only because the Ottomans, Ottoman Empire ceded the provinces in Central Europe and Adriatic to its enemies, but also because with the treaty, the Ottoman Empire accepted certain norms and conventions of European diplomacy, such as Utis Positetis. Rami Mehmet needed to defend his role to the Ottoman public by illustrating that, in fact, the Ottomans did not blindly accept European norms and conventions, but rather thoroughly negotiated them. In fact, Rami Mehmed intended, intended to document that the Ottomans crafted the Karlovist negotiations with their own visions of borders, sovereignty, and territory. In many ways, the, the peace treaties, the text, was written to illustrate that, illustrate how the Ottoman delegation fashioned the principles of Utis Positetis with their own conception. After a long prelude narrating how the negotiations started, Rami Mehmet discusses why eternal and resi res resilience peace, Sulhu Edep or Mueket Sulh ve Salah in Turkish, was preferred to temporary peace and ceasefire. Peace, Rami Mehmet wrote, should also be an attempt to revitalize friendship between the polities and sovereign sovereigns. It should be based on mutual understanding, interest, and trust between the sovereigns and the states. It should also uphold the well-being of the people, especially those who lived on borderlands. Therefore, eternal peace required elimination of the frontier conflicts and disorders on the borderlands, as well as clearance and elimination of offenses by demolition of some of the military fortresses on the, on the borders. To this aim, the principle of Utus Positetis should be prevailed, he said. However, peace is a difficult task. 
the essence of these principles should be well implemented in accordance with the interest of the sovereigns and polities, as well as well-being of the people. It should be carefully implemented in accordance with the necessities of the time. Through the text, Rami Mehmet refuses to accept the principle of utis blindly. The Austrians, he argues, intend to implement the principle without any qualification and exception, is this not Olmasen. For the Ottoman delegation, however, the principle should be implemented in different ways, in different cases. It should be thoroughly negotiated for each case in, a, in accordance with specific conditions. The difference between the Ottoman and Habsburg ways was particularly clear when they negotiated how to carry out the eliminations. The Habsburg delegation argued that parties knew which locality was under the control of which army. Therefore, negotiations should start with a chart or a map or both illustrating the current situation after the war. The Austrians declared that they have already prepared the chart and the map for negotiation. And it is if the Ottomans delegation had disagreements uh, with, with that, with the documents, the parties should debate on, on paper on these documents. The Ottoman delegation strongly refused this proposal. Quote, after the chart was prepared, it would be hard to negotiate on it. Therefore, the Ottoman delegation did not accept the chart or a map and they proposed that the negotiations should be carried out verbally. Face-to-face -face negotiations is more beneficial than debating on paper. But more importantly, this was a difficult task. It cannot be carried out by pen. Anyway, each item should be questioned and answered face to face. One cannot prepare a chart and a map for every case and negotiate it over and over by preparing new charts and maps. It will be a huge waste of time. We came here to, to mutually converse on the matters. If the settlement had been possible by charting, there would have been no need for such a face to face summit." End quote. The Ottoman delegation clearly refused starting the negotiations with the chart and or a map. They might have, although uh, they might have thought that the Austrians had a better grasp on the geography and map making, therefore they might have been concerned about the fait accompli. However, this was also a methodological and epistemological problem. The Ottoman refused to deduct the method. The negotiation should not only be oral and face-to-face, -face, but also detailed, detailed decisions about border making should not be given on the negotiation table. Uh, the decisions about the border making should not be given on the negotiation paper, the table, but this task should be left to the local commissions in, part, in participation of local actors on the ground. This is uh, one of the maps prepared for by the Habsburgs uh, during the um, negotiations. The borders code, the borders should be delimit delimited by the representatives who were appointed for border making. They should invite impartial, respected, elected, and knowledgeable people from the local communities of two sides of the border and had them carried out the specific Specific, uh, specifics of the demarcation. The established convention should prevail. Rami Mehmet proposed these three steps in border making decision. First, the parties negotiated the overall peace settlement. They should write down the principles or agreed on the principles. Second, the parties could agree on obvious natural borders, such as mountains, rivers, and well-known landmarks. The third step were detailed details of demarcation, especially where there were no obvious natural borders. This, should, this duty should be left to the local commissions and local people. Rami Mehmed wrote, quote, this duty could not be accomplished by those who negotiated the treaty on the table, since local situation is not known to them, end quote. And then he said, the deeds should be carried out on the ground. Each zeminde suret pezir olup. Rami Mehmet juxtaposed the Ottoman and Habsburg methods. Quote, your method stipulates that the borders and border 
barriers, boundaries, sorry, should be first charted and mapped. Ta'ayunu tasvir, at the meeting, as an overview. The par particularities will be decided later. What we proposed was the opposite. We proposed to start from the particulars on the ground and handled each case separately. At the end, we will come to the best conclusion. Rami Mehmed Efendi proudly states that the final the Habsburg delegation accepted this reasonable proposal. The Ottoman strongly, the Ottoman strong rejection of a negotiation on charts and large-scale cartographic maps, and insistence on an in interactive face-to-face -face negotiations, and leaving the job to local commissions and local knowledge were presented as a diplomatic victory. As a result, the local commissions composed of Ottomans and Habsburg delegations and notables of the local communities started to work on the ground to demarcate uh, soon after the, for demarcation soon after the treaties were signed and it continued three years. <clears throat> As the main issue in the negotiations was how to interpret the principles of Utis Positetis, the main disagreement was on the province of Erda, Transylvania. Transylvania is show uh, here, right? This area between Romania and Hungary today. Half of it Hungary, half of Romania. And this is, um, okay. After the war, the most of the province and small fortresses of, and towns were under the occupation of the Habsburg army, armies. However, the capital city and the main fortress of the province, Temeshvar, or Timeshwara today, in Western Romania was left under the Ottomans, Ottoman uh, control, of, uh, control of the Ottomans. The question was how to delimine, the elimination would take place. And these depictions were the earlier depictions of the 16th century about uh, the conquest of Temeshwar um, by the Ottomans. The Habsburg delegation intended to draw the border by separating the regions under the Ottomans and the regions under the Habsburg, Habsburgs in accordance with Utis Positetis. The Ottoman delegation, however, insisted that Transylvania and the city of Timeshwara were integrated and not separable. If the capital city and its hinterland were separate, separate, separated, the communities would suffer. Most of the population was under the Ottoman control. The communities needed, to cap needed the capital city, rivers and the hinterland altogether. The province should not be divided, but handled as a whole. Bütün ayırtılanmaya muhtaçtır. It's a very interesting term, actually. The Habsburg delegation rejected this reasoning, arguing that they occupied the provinces with force. Therefore, according to Utis Positetis, it was not reasonable for the Ottomans to ask them to cede the occupied lands and fortresses. Furthermore, yes, the Ottomans kept the capital city, but the Habsburg armies captured several other fortresses and towns, majority wins over minority. Rami Mehmed Efendi wrote that the Ottoman de uh, determination pushed the Habsburg to agree with, uh, agreed to withdraw a fertile part of the province known as Shebesh. However, the Habsburgs insisted that the rivers running two sides of the regions should be controlled by them. The Ottomans did not accept this and argued that the main aim of the peace was the well-being and prosperity of the people. After the war, region should be recovered the communities should grow. Peace and prosperity were two sides of the same coin. The prosperity can be only achieved if the province was not divided and the rivers were freely used by the people. Transylvania was a natural entity. Its borders were drawn by the will of God. Temeşver eyaleti lütfi hakla kendinden sınır bulmuş bir memlekettir. The Ottoman case of units, Utis Positetis was based on the natural boundaries, economic and environmental unity of the province and well-being of the well-being and prosperity of the people. Quote, we told them, Rami said, the aim of the great state is to rejuvenation of, of the cities, villages and the countryside. 
However, if we divide the province as you proposed, the communities would not benefit from water. Then we asked them whether they should not drink water. The Austrians said they cannot prevent humans and animals from having water. Then we asked again, so if they live nearby rivers, should not they eat fish? They shouldn't they eat fish? No, they said, we would not prevent them from fishing with boats as hunting with animals is blessed by God, wild animals. Then we ask whether fish cannot fish, fish can be eaten without bread. Rami wrote that the Ottoman delegation made a case for the agricultural hinterland and rivers of Temeshwar province. Wheat was transported from farms via rivers, river boats to the mills, which were located along the rivers. However, the water and current of the nearby river was not enough. Therefore, the Ottoman, deleg dele Ottoman delegation insisted the borders should be drawn with the Tsitsa River, which was a further away. The Ottomans demarcated that, demonstrated that they had grasp on the local conditions, but also natural knowledge of the region. This knowledge combined with the case they made for the well-being and prosperity of the communities enabled the Ottoman, Ottomans to compete the, uh, the Austrians, who used large-scale geographical maps and charts of the region. It was a competition between local knowledge and maps. Conclusion. This paper discusses only a tiny bit of one of the major historical puzzles of Ottoman history, namely how the Ottomans conceptualized space, territory, frontier, and borderland. Still, I think the account of Rami Mehmed provides us with an insightful perspective in, the, in this transitionary moment. Let me briefly summarize Rami Mehmed's position. Peace should be eternal. Therefore, peace treaties should be well designed based on mutual friendship and trust and the well being of the people. Borders should be fixed by delimitations based on mutual agreements and the principles of Utus Pusidetis. They should be freed from offensive elements. The goal is to well-being and prosperity of the borderland communities. The border-making process should not be top-down. Borders should be decided by commissions, which with the help of the local actors having local knowledge. Participation of local communities was a crucial as they, their prosperity and well-being. Instead of deciding the matters on maps and charts, the parties should negotiate, the negotiate and deliberate the matters face to face. Deliberation is preferred to decision based on maps and charts, where it is preferred to pan. Well-being of the people requires an understanding of local conditions, nature, environment, and economy. Natural boundaries, water production, are key for border making. Utis Posidetis should be interpreted in accordance with human and environmental conditions. Well, the Ottomans made beautiful maps, and I put some of them there uh, in the exhibition from the you know, six, uh, 18th century version of a 16th century famous um, uh, book of navigation by Peter Reis. But they, uh, they also know about European maps, but they did not employ maps for practical matters of administration and border making. This was one of the puzzles of Ottoman history. Why the cadastral maps or border maps came, not, uh, you know, were not used by, by the Ottomans. One possible answer to this question is that maps were not seen as useful instruments for such matters. The Ottoman preferred rather verbal descriptions of space and place. But the Ottomans also saw maps as political instruments, which were not necessarily helping their interests especially in diplomatic wars. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, I, I wanna just briefly thank Karen and Martin for inviting me to take part in what has been an incredibly stimulating event. And thanks to all the participants and organizers. It's really, um, it's a very exciting place to be. Well, yesterday, Jordan Branch started us off with a, a call to find 
ways to break out of conventions of sovereign nation state mapping. Um, uh, Frank Billet suggested that we may lack the imagination to think outside of those rigid conventions that structure so much of our cartographic thinking. I'd like to propose today that maps of Siberia in our early 18th century Russia, what we call the Petrine period, the period of Peter the Great, provide some potential models for setting aside those conventions. Early 18th century Russia was barely touched by the ideas of Westphalia and all of those early modern political theorists and went their own way. So this may just be a site of creative non-Westphalian cartography. I should add though, especially with the shadow of Russia's trampling on Ukrainian sovereignty hanging over all of us, as Barbara Mundy pointed out yesterday so powerfully, these alternative modes of mapping may be not one whit more emancipatory or humane, just different. So, as I said, I'm looking at the, pe the period of Peter the Great, who you see on your right, in a famous portrait, which seemed appropriate for today's conference, since he's confidently draping his arm over a map in a very possessive kind of move. And he's showing us just how you gain territory by pointing that sharp sword tip right at the map. Well, he was very interested in maps and one of his early acts was to commission the man on the left, this is a complete fabrication. We have no idea what he looked like, but this is a monument in the city of Tumyan in Siberia. He commissioned Simeon Re Remizov, who was a cartographer born and raised and self-educated, self-trained in the Siberian city of Tavolsk, to create an atlas or a set of maps to show Peter what his lands were in Siberia. And Remizov took this um, seriously and created a series of manuscript atlases, three beautiful manuscript atlases. They remained in manuscript. They weren't published for hundreds of years. They were one-offs, but we know that lots of people were interested in them. And in fact, some foreigners gained access to them and tried to bring them, smuggle them out of the country or pieces of them. I like that the, the monument to Remizov also shows his maps in bronze. Well, this map seems like a good place to start to look at Remizov's work and at ideas of sovereignty in these maps. First glance, I think it's hard even to know this spectacular thing is a map. Uh, let me orient you a little. So if everyone would stand on their heads, that would help because it is oriented with the south at the top and the north at the bottom. The speckled black and white along the bottom and, and left-hand margins are oceans, the Arctic and the Pacific. China's that orange bit up in the top left. And Great Muscovy is indicated partially with the orange blob on the right. Um, Moscow itself is not shown. So here we have the Eurasian expanse from Muscovy to the Pacific, Peter's territory, which he was so interested in viewing. But where is Peter's territory? Where is the Russian empire? Where is any mention of Russia or Russian presence in this land? And where are the borders? Where does it end? Very unclear from this map. 
it's not that Remezov was indifferent to borders. These are bounded units that he's showing us, clearly differentiated. There, as you can see here, it's called the ethnographic map, our term, not his, but it's called that because it shows the different ethnic groups, what he calls rade. Uh, rod is the root of words meaning birth and kind and um, kin. So these are the lands of different kinds of peoples, uh, different kinds of people. Uh, land and people are, are pushed together. So certain people are represented as belonging on particular pieces of land. Remizov tells us that the shariki, the blobs of different colors, uh, show us where the different people live and that they never cross their borders at risk of provoking war. Whether that's true or not, who knows, but that's what he says. So borders are present, but what we would call international borders or inter-imperial borders are not in any way remarked on differently than what we might call these interior uh, ethnographic divisions. Um, so I'm gonna show you a, uh, a close up of that corner showing China up here. So there's the land of the Tsardom of China. Um, again, no different from the other uh, differentiated color blocks. The land of Korea is over here, uh, the yellow, uh, yellow bit. Boundedness of the great kingdom of China is often shown, I'll, I'll show you some that have the great wall indicated. But otherwise, the boundary is not visible here other than a color line. I'm gonna take you now to the bottom, to the far north, the Arctic, um, and look at the way he depicts ethnic groups that may or may not belong to the Russian empire. So here he's indicating two groups of Samayedi called Nyansi today. They're shown as separate, they're labeled with their tribal name as, as he understands it. But over here, we have another group of Samayedi or Nyansi uh, who are labeled unpeaceful Samayedi or Nimirnia. Well, what does that mean? That means that they have refused to come under the czar's mighty hand as the sources say. They've refused to acknowledge his overlordship and they've refused to pay yasak, that is tribute in fur, which is one of Russia's big motivations to be there. This is a zone of exception, if you will. This is a hole in the map of non-peaceful, non-tribute payers. So the map shows a kind of complicated calculus of borders and borderlessness of internal and external differentiation of sovereignty. I wanna take us now to one of his other atlases. The, the one I just showed you, the Churchoshnaya Kniga, is a big, magnificent book that he turned into Moscow as ordered. The one we just saw was the last of 26 maps in that, in that album. This is his own working notebook. This is where he charted the course of different major rivers in segments. So these, the ones I'm gonna be showing you are from segments of the Amur River. And I really like this shot because it's a loose leaf overlay, a loose leaf sheet overlaying on another map, which I'll show you in a minute. This is called the choreographic sketchbook. So this is the Amur River. As you can see, this notebook was put together between 1697 and 1711. That is well after the negotiation of the Treaty of Nerchinsk in 1689. Remizov's involved with the mapping of Siberia. He's involved with understanding trade routes and diplomacy with China. He knows about the Treaty of Nerchinsk. And yet we see no 
border marked here uh, other than the Amur River, which serves as the border according to the treaty. Oh, there's, uh, by the way, whoop. No, that's not working. Let me see if I can show you. Well, maybe you can see the Great Wall up here, the Tsardom of China. I'm going to show you a close up of this little bit, visually unmarked, but labeled. Rika Garbica, tut pastavlina granica. The river Garbica, there was set a border. So he knows about the border, but he's not interested in showing it. An even more intriguing indication is on that page that was hidden by the overlay, uh, which is this. And I'm going to show us this segment where. We have Gran Kitaiskaya, so boundary marker of China. And there's this little chess pawn figure that he's drawn in. This is kind of interesting because there are some disputes in the historical literature about whether stone boundary markers were actually set after the Treaty of Nerchinsk or whether it waited till Kiakta in 1727. Um, but Judging by Remezov's map, at least he thought an actual border boundary marker was set. That's Nerchinsk with a little boat on the river. If not particularly preoccupied with sovereign boundaries, what, what was Remezov up to? After all, this, these are maps commissioned by his emperor who wants to see his sovereign space. So what is the sovereign space that's being mapped in this huge trans-Eurasian project? Well, it's people. So here you can see the tents of some of the indigenous Siberian tribute payers. Here, the Arbunuti shown with their um, peaked tents. Interestingly, there's a, a silver mine uh, textually indicated there as well. These squares indicate peasant villages, Russian or Cossack, presumably, with the square markers. And they're named with family names, like those ones we saw in the Chinese maps uh, yesterday. One of the maps over there shows individual uh, arable fields, each field marked off. Tremendous level of individuation going on here. This is a map of the Mangazea region. Um, and this text right under the leaping animal shows us next to those two houses, little peasant houses, says, the great sovereigns, um, ag agricultural peasants of the Mangazea region live here. Two people. Two people. <laughs> That's a pretty extraordinary level of granularity in a project that is mapping the entire expanse of Siberia. So uh, this is another one showing uh, free Tunguzi of various tribes uh, marked by, oh, this doesn't work, but marked by those little uh, circles above the lakes. Free is a negative term, meaning undisciplined, masterless, not submitting to tribute. So I would say Remezov was indeed preoccupied with questions of sovereignty, but it was sovereignty worked out in individualized reciprocal relationships. And again, when I say reciprocal, and given the context of the day, I really wanna stress this, this doesn't mean everyone was happy. 
This doesn't mean it was a jolly consensus. It wasn't the lovely, uh, peaceable, friendly, trusting relationship that we just heard about in Ali's uh, presentation. These were coercive, no doubt, and highly inequitable. But they had to be reciprocal. There had to be acknowledgement of sovereignty uh, and payment of tribute in order to make sovereignty work. Sovereignty was built in those relationships, not in any kind of homogeneously controlled space. And the holes, the lattice work of this control were just as important in the mapping of sovereignty as the claims to the entire expanse. Sovereignty then was about people and most of all about piles of warm, luxurious sable skins. So thank you very much for those very stimulating conversations and um, or presentations about the nature of sovereignty. It is very thought provoking to think that um, it's these relationships were about peace, uh, mutuality as defined by people and cultures who did not understand those concepts mutually. So we're, the floor is open to questions. If you have them, yes. Just <laughs> like I talked about yesterday, I go first, but um, thank you for these fantastic papers and talks today. Really interesting engagement with these concepts. I guess I would ask Valerie about this notion of sovereignty and what you, do you think, this is sort of getting back, some of us were talking about dinner last night. The notion of sovereignty you were speaking about at the end, which I think is entirely convincing, reminds me a lot of the way that someone like Peter Solins talks about the sort of pre-territorial authority of monarchs in Western Europe before the delimitation of boundaries, that it was about a person-to-person -person relationship, even if that was abstracted on a larger scale. So do you see this as being very as sort of similar to that, if you're familiar with that work, or do you think this is something that is different because of the sort of context of, I mean, very, I mean, the idea of mapping two people, right? That, that Does that make it different in some way? And then it, also, I guess I would ask just, it wasn't in your paper, but sort of following on, is there a point, I remember at the end of your written paper, where mapping started to be done a little bit differently, focusing more on maybe territory and boundaries. Do you think that the notion of sovereignty changed in that phase post uh, uh, Peter the Great? Oh, is this okay? Okay. Um, yeah, great, great questions. Would it be possible to get the presentation up again? Thanks. Um, so let me start with the first point. Yes, I think it has a lot in common with that pre-Westphalian concept of dominion over people. And it has echoes with sort of classic feudal models that that reciprocity is certainly something that's familiar. I do think there's something different in the colonial imperial uh, context, but I'll have to think more about what it is that's, that's actually different. It's certainly, it's different, I think, from, we were talking yesterday about your um, reproduction of that French image where it's cities or fortresses, that kind of pointillist uh, image of, of sovereignty. Um, I think it's different from that because there are no centers of power. That's that's moot. Um, but yeah, that's a great question. I I wanted to um, just very briefly. Let's see. Oh no, it went away. Sorry. I wanted to show this really eerie map that I closed the written version of the paper with. It's a map by Joseph Nicolas de Lille, French 
map maker, cartographer, um, which is the first map I've found of Russia that effaces all of those internal divisions and just makes a claim that this is all Russia. There we are, thank you. And the holding of her Imperial Majesty, this is under Anna Ioannovna, who's the niece of Peter the Great. So this is, this is pretty unambiguous, all of this is mine. But it's such a dreamlike kind of indeterminate map. It's so hard to tell what's ocean, what's land. This is the new world over here, but where does it start? <laughs> so it does change, but it's still not something exactly recognizable, I would say. Thanks for those questions. We're going to be hearing this afternoon about controls on mobility as a different form of mapping sovereignty, right? And looking at your maps where rivers are so prominent and in a place probably without permanent roads, I wondered if you have information about are we seeing more than the watersheds? Is this, is this really a transportation infrastructure effectively that's being shown on those maps too? You've arrived. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. That's what it is. So they are, well, not this one, but they are usable maps if you're bound to the rivers and what happens outside of the rivers remains mysterious for a very long time. So that that's exactly right. That's how Remy's off was moving. He'll give travel times. He'll say, this is three weeks by boat um, and three months by uh, camel or, or horse or whatever it is, or sometimes this is three weeks by boat and you can't get there any other way. <laughs> <laughs> There's a digital history project at Harvard, right? On Kelly, Kelly O'Neill uh, working on this River Rhine world and transportation system. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for a beautiful presentation. I have one question from um Ali you use this um in in your, one of your quotation you use great state the word what is the the turkish what, word for the devlet aliye means yeah the exalted state or great state it's a kind of a term what was the word devlet aliye is it the established Ali, concept? Ali, my name also come from the same. Is it the established concept or yeah. it was just a... Uh, yeah, it's a, I mean, they never call themselves Ottoman Empire or something. <laughs> Could you elaborate? In the 19th century. Bit, uh, we, since when this term come from? In Italy, I think six, like 15th century onwards. But mm -hmm. The exalted state or the great state, yeah. Okay, so uh, in in Mongolia, we have that term yeah. since the secret history. Oh, there, yeah, there's... Autumn, it basically autumn, means sister, great empires. state. Yeah. yeah, I think that, yeah, the idea is this is this state, right? I mean, and um, so they don't really call themselves in, the, you know, the dynastic name or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. There's only one, yeah. And one question from Valerie. Um, what taxonomies uh, remains of use except, or it's just a rod? You say, you know, Remzov says these, the named names. What I actually see is the, just the names. And you say he calls them Rodi. It's just a Rodi. And for example, the great Muscovy or the grand Muscovy is Rodi too? No. So then what are the taxonomies used in there? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, so they, he does say uh, in the map, for instance, the land, it just says Z, um, of Tunguz of Mnogich Radov, Tunguz of many kinds or many clans. So he uses that for the, the Siberian people. For China or Korea, he'll just say the land or the kingdom or the Tsarstva. So they do get, get political indicators. They're not classed as people, which is a really interesting observation. I really appreciate that. Or just the land of the 
Wait, we need a microphone. So are each of these units on that map the land of blank? And sometimes the blank is a rod or people, and sometimes it's a political designation? That's right. Wherever you see a little Z, that means land. And so we have Zimlia Velika, uh, Velika Moscova, for instance. Yeah. So this is for both of you. Uh, Ali, you made the observation in the negotiation of the borders, the sensitivity that border zones are communities and people interact with each other, which is important for us to remember, right? <laughs> that they're not very sharp. But then uh, Valerie, you had the, um, the observation that these people would stay in their territories and not interact. And so it's a very different understanding of the relationship between people and territory. Can you comment on that? Uh, okay, yeah, here. It's interesting because Valerie's talk is on the maps and in my talk, I tried to understand why the Ottomans refused using maps. And this is one of the reason. On maps, you fix things. People are one place, other people are one place as well. So, this is what they refuse, right? I mean, that using maps as a, as a political instrument, uh, I mean, they also think that it's not for their interest, obviously, but they try to make it, it's not all, also the interest of the people using the maps, but they also use maps. I mean, that we have also similar maps like showing peoples and stuff, but uh, yeah, I mean, maps in the Ottoman, I think in that negotiation, it's very clear that maps were not, Maps were refused in, because they uh, prevented people from participating, from you know negotiating, or from taking part in this process. And then Ottomans thought that it's beneficial for them if they somehow mobilize the people. It's very interesting, you know, like a semi-epistemological, semi-political maneuver. <clears throat> yeah, great, great points. Um, so. Remisov does show movement on the maps. He uses the word uh, off very often. They wander or they nomadize in this region. So he's, he, he kind of builds movement into the map. The, the, they don't cross borders is interesting because he has the, because if they do, they cause warfare. So it's clear that he's suggesting, he knows that somehow. <laughs> And so there is, is movement across the border. What about the difference between nomads and the settled, like peasants and stuff? I mean, do they, do they show in the map? Well, they show, I think, with those different uh, uh, conventional indicators, tents. That's are, nomadic versus right, villages. Right, right, yeah. Real quick, yes. Uh, can you pull up that map again? Which one? Sorry. That, that, that one, yep. Yeah. It, you know, she discussed about the, the Len Ketaiskova. And then below there, there is Zimlia Bogdaskova. That's Mongolia. Mm -hmm. And then, then Zimlia Cherny Mongolo. That's also Mongolia. So it's not, these are the, the you know, Mongols are the, supposedly the, the, the nomads, right? So it's not, it's not purely sort of, you know, people's description. These are basically sort of, you know, political units, as I see. So. Um, I just want to say um, that we're almost out of time. And I'm wondering if I can take the privilege of asking a question um, of both of you. And that is to challenge the way you use the word sovereignty. I mean, I'm reading the maps that Peter the Great commissioned as not a question of um, who does he control, but from whom can he reliably extract resources? I mean, they don't really have an interest in controlling the population, but really locating where they can get resources. I'm, I'm not sure that would be sovereignty. And also, Ali, you really raised provocative questions about what one culture considers um, who is able to speak about sovereignty and who is not. And I'm not sure it's masked by this, this idea of eternal peace, but you can't have eternal peace between cultures that one, on the one hand, want territorial borders to be observed, and the other um, to have the integrity of people and populations observed. Mm. So I'm just wondering if um, how 
why we're using the term sovereignty as such, even though I know that's the name of the conference. I think you just answered your question. <laughs> uh, I do think the Russians have an ambition to, to exercise more control than that. They are the court of um, resolution, even for intra-Indigenous matters, uh, or at least one of them, and they like that. So they're, it's, it's uh, uh, I think, aspirational. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Ali, but I want to ask a question myself, since there are all these experts here. People have argued that this is the first known ethnographic map. And if anyone has thoughts on that later, let me know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, the, I didn't really talk about sovereignty, did I? Um, yeah. Um, but I, I think from just from the from that text, if if I think about that text, it's very interesting actually. Um, seems that sovereignty is a, is a it's not um, a position or status, a process. It's it's something to that in making, and it's not uh, to be to be made only by sultanic claim or you know royal claim or something. It's a process participated by different actors, including nature and resources. Um, only with mobilization and acceptance and peace, mobilization of resources, acceptance of the people, they're in fact somehow um, um, except, I mean, the uh, um, um, Law, what's the term, um, the uh, consent and the, the mobilization of the resources, sovereignty can be possible. And then boundaries can only be drawn through this process. It's not done, it's, boundaries cannot be decided between sovereigns. But this is very interesting. I mean, this is really, this really sh uh, makes ma made me think about also the Ottoman internal boundaries and how they see about territory space. And so, I mean, I'm not talking about like kind of Ottoman humanism or something here, but uh, but the way that they think about um, the idea of people, communities, and nature, and how they come up with a kind of a kind of an interesting holistic attitude towards you know uh, borders and sovereignty. So this is, in fact, this paper is, I think, um, going right. if somewhere. Thank you very much. Um, thank you both very much. And we're keeping some people from the next cup of coffee. So we should call it. Thank you very much. Uh -huh.